Okay, so welcome, hello. Thank you for joining us. This is a um, Salesforce Portland admin user group session about managing permissions and specifically how myself, Michael Montez, um, and the, the team over at NORC in Chicago, how we moved or, or and are moving from pro profiles, permissions on profiles to permissions on permission sets and permission set groups. So that's what you're about to experience, hopefully. Um, so the question is why? Why did we feel like we needed to do this? You know, what, what are the motivating factors behind uh, going after such a, what seems like a, for many of us, and depending on the org, of course, a very heavy, a very big lift. Did we need more work? Was that the, the issue? Were we getting bored? Um, well, for us specifically, we had recently completed a pretty good overhaul of our system. And we had added uh, some objects, um, updated our business processes, things like that. We also rolled in two new business groups into the org. So we had a new set of users who had different needs and uh, things like that. And then it was November of 23. So there was a bit of slowness. There was a, a window of opportunity, as we say, um, along that. So we decided that this would be a good time for us to tackle this before you know, we got out of control before our user base got too large or we started to do things that may not have been best practice. We wanted to try to re rein it in before. And then of course we also saw some talk of uh, retirement of permissions on profiles. And specifically we saw uh, this post here from Cheryl uh, Feldman, product manager of, I think it's users or admin or backend or some, something, but she said, specifically that they are now seeing the end of life in spring 26. End of life of permissions on profiles, not the end of life of profiles, not the end of life of permissions, but specifically permissions on profiles. And then of course, over the next few weeks, we'll have a, form, a more formal announcement. So that was in January of 2023. Um, we had this time now starting at the beginning of November, 2023. And we actually completed the project um, right around, right after Thanksgiving, kind of moved all of our users over at the end of November, 2023, which was great for us. However, right at December of 2023, she shared with the, the, the world <laughs> that we are no longer going to enforce the 26th end of life, but we still recommend a permission set led security model, which was great because that's what we had done. So great, we're ahead of the curve. Who knows when end of life for permissions on profiles will be, but we think that this is a much better and a much more scalable solution for our team going forward as well. And uh, so we, you know, we we went, we went with it. We kept it. Obviously, we're not going to go back, but um, that's what we did. So a couple, a little bit of uh, level setting. We needed to do a couple things in order to get this, get our minds wrapped around what we were going to be trying to do, and. Ultimately, you need to understand what should be on a profile and what should be moved over to a permission set. So this is from an article called Admin Best Practices for User Management, again by Cheryl. This is back in 2022 that she put this out. So we were using this as kind of our base, uh, our base um, for what, we, what should stay on profiles and what we should move over to our permission sets. And as you see here, the permission sets should be system permissions, objects, apps, et cetera. On the profiles, is going to go back down to real small, a very limited amount of information or amount of access on the profile. It's going to be recommended to use the minimum access profile. We can set our defaults for the record types and apps and then page layout assignments. Um, now, page layout assignments is interesting because the page layout, uh, as it exists in classic page layout, versus the new page Builder, which is the Lightning Page Builder or the Lightning Dynamic Pages, two separate things. Page layout assignments is for the old pages. Dynamic Lightning Pages are done in a different method. They're not tied to profiles necessarily, so there is no way to do that. The old page layouts are not going to be improved. There, that has been shared um, from the Salesforce. Old page layout assignments. There is going to be no improvement to how those are managed, and uh, so. Even though they're on a profile, they're really not going to get that much leverage. And then, of course, login hours and IP ranges will be part of the profile as well. So that's what we kind of settled on. Okay, those are the, we're going to keep that over there. We're going to move all this other stuff to permission sets. 
The other piece of technology within Salesforce that we wanted to leverage is a relatively new, it's 2020, I think, permission set groups. And if you're not familiar with them, permission set groups just allow you to take a set of permission sets, put them into this group, and they will, they then, in, that group inherits all the permissions that you've added into the group. So if you have one permission set that says account read, you have another permission set that has account edit, then you put those two into a permission set group. Your permission set group has read and edit on the account, you know, by default. Um, so that's to say it includes the permission sets of more than one permission set group. Then the other function of a permission set group and what makes them useful, more useful, is that you can actually mute out or disable certain permissions that have been enabled by the permissions sets that you've added. So if, again, you have two permission sets, one for account read, one for account edit. You can mute edit if you wanted to and say, so the permission set group has all the permissions that it's been shared with it. And then at the group level, you can mute out or disable some of those functions. That includes field visibility, field editability, object levels to items, system, system, um, system information, system permissions, things like that. So they're, they're nice in that you can put a lot of stuff in and then shut it down or disable it with that permission set group. So those are gonna be the, you know, that's where we're gonna be living. Permission set groups, permission sets, and a minimum access profile. The last thing we had to think about with our users is the concept of a persona. So all of your users are doing, if you're not familiar with personas, here's kind of the definition, but essentially it's, you know, who are our users? What are they doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What things do they need access to? How are they using our system? Things like that. Do they need access to these objects? Do they need access to these system permissions? Are, can we put them in groups together and give them some commonality? Um, things like that. So we sat down at the table, um, the four of us, and we kind of hashed out, put together, who are our personas? What do they do? We put a little, you know, a little, uh, you know, meet Jane, meet John, meet Joe, anybody with a J name, meet them all. Um, and what do they do with the company? How do they need to use our Salesforce org? So what we walked away with from that exercise was, this is a small example, of course, but this, a list of personas down the, side and across the top various objects and system permissions that they may or may not need access to so you can see here that there's an amerispeak business unit amerispeak persona they need access to accounts this object called mork they need access to opportunities but they're not going to schedule dashboards as an example if you go down the column you'll see business development that's our operations team they need full access across the board including delete um, and they do need to schedule dashboards and do other things. And then finally, our financial analyst persona, they're really just gonna read most of this stuff, but they are gonna be scheduling dashboards as an example. So we did this for all of our objects across the top, as well as all of our system permissions that are available within your permission set. And we ended up with a large chart of yeses and nos and CRUDs and things like that. Um, and we had, so there were seven, I think. And one thing to remember is don't forget to include yourself as an administrator, an administrator persona, so that you can layer on your security or you know keep your things going as well. Okay. So speaking of layering, this is the layer access that we ended up with. Um, we have our minimum access profile. We created a permission set called the NORC base permission set that just gives access to standard objects, accounts, contacts. Uh, the NORC, we have a custom object called NORC. We have a couple, another custom object called team members, things like that. Um, for the most part, every single user in our org needs to see accounts. They need to add team members. They need to add contacts, things like that. And then within those groups, we have our different personas, as you saw. And then we also have specialty access for things like their financial analysts. So here's a breakdown. Every single user gets the minimum access profile as well as the NORC base permission set. So once your user is created in Salesforce, these two things will be a part of your rec user record, guaranteed. Everybody gets it. 
Then, based on your job role, based on your persona, we layer on a permission set group that opens up access to additional fields or makes things editable. Um, we use custom permissions, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we add a custom permission within your persona, to, and I'll show you how we use those. And then um, for our other teams, like our contracts team and our financial analysts, they get another permission set on top of that for specialty access to access to, to custom objects that only they use, custom reporting, things like that. So a couple of things we learned. Um, first and foremost, you're going to want to use your minimum access Salesforce profile. Unfortunately, for most of us, it was the case for us, our minimum access profile was not clean. That is to say it was not default, not set to its default settings. Like if you were to spin up a new dev org today, you can look at the minimum access Salesforce profile and look at all the access that it gives you. It has very little turned on by default. So object access is almost, I don't think there's any tabs, none, apps, no apps defaulted, no visual force, nothing. Uh, system permissions are pretty minimal. So again, this just gives you basically a profile and a license to get you in the door. And it does include access activities, chatter, internal user, lightning console, et cetera, as you see there in the second bullet. But for the most part, that's it. So what you have to do is if you're going to use this profile, check it out, go through it, and reset it, essentially. Get it back down to zero. Um, you can do it a couple of ways. Um, you could, like I said, go create a dev environment, not tied to your um, sandbox. Don't, don't create a sandbox that's tied to yours because you'll just pull over all the permissions. But go out to Salesforce, dev.salesforce.com or something, and create a net new. And you can actually export the metadata for that minimum access profile. And I believe you could also search somewhere and find the metadata for a minimum access profile. And you could upload that metadata if you have a a CLI or some a tool like that. Otherwise, you'll go through and uncheck the boxes, uncheck access, change the tab settings, things like that to get you kind of back to back to zero to reset your your minimum access profile. So we had to do that. We had to go back and reset our minimum access profile. We did it in a sandbox. So you know we were in a sandbox, launched it up, and it just went in there and unchecked whatever we need to uncheck, changed our permissions for the profile, and got it back down to base. Uh, the next piece that we did was we went and created our NORC base permission set. And again, this is going to be standard objects and custom objects that all users need. Um, we, your permission sets will allow you to um, turn on system permissions. So all of our users are going to be running flows. So we turn that on. They all want to edit tasks, etc. So we had a bunch of these system permissions that we knew everybody needed to use. So they turn that on in the permission set level at our, at our in our NORC base permission set. Um, so just kind of think of it that way. Then we turned on a couple of apps, custom built apps, which is, as you know, apps are just a set of tabs that not just a set of tabs, but a set of tabs for um, uh, for the users to do their day to day, give some access to those, and then um, we also use the profile excuse me, the profile permission set and uh, record types for our Lightning record page assignments. And we'll take a look at that in a second. The next thing we had to do was go and build our permission set groups for our personas. So again, we have some, we have three major personas, uh, healthcare, Amerispeak, and research. Each one of them got a permission set group. Then we had to go and build individual permissions, not individual permissions, but permission sets specific to that um, persona where we opened up or closed off um, certain access to fields and objects, things like that. And again, some of them have the need to do additional system permissions like use the console or do report building. Um, each one of our personas also has a custom set of tabs called we call it you know an app so there's an amerispeak app a healthcare app and a research app so we put each one of those into each persona and then for each of these personas we gave them a custom permission that's basically the same name so there's an amerispeak custom permission a 
research custom permission and each one of they each have their own and then finally some of our users have we have some installed packages that are specific to those types of users um, and i'll show you an example in a second but we put those permission sets into those package into this group so that those particular users could access those specific um, package package elements okay all right, finally, uh, we went out and built our specialty access, our permission sets. So our financial, financial analysts um, need access to a very specific object that nobody else uses. Um, they, so they have access to that. They also have a custom permission that says they're financial analysts. There's a system permission updates where they can view all data in some cases. Uh, edit list views is one place where you might want to use a, a specialty access because you don't want everybody building list views, public list views, but maybe you trust a couple of people, so you give them a, a ability to edit list views. And then again, additional installed packages, permission sets, uh, permissions from installed packages for those specific users. Okay, so here's a little look at kind of the app access and the default record types. There's the profile is on the left and the permission sets are on the right. So you can see if you look across from left to right, the profile, the minimum access profile, you can see that it says the app name and it allows you to select the default. Whereas on the other side, on the right side of the screen, this is a permission set where I've granted this permission set app uh, access to the app called Amerispeak. Now you can only grant access, you can't set it as a default within the permission set. You can do that in a profile. So what we ended up doing is we didn't want, we all of our users have minimum access Salesforce, right? All of our users get the same profile, but not all of our users are using the same apps. So we don't want to set a default and give it to everybody. So what we did, we, we used the all tabs app as the default on the profile. Every user can see all tabs and then on the permission set, we assigned the specific app for those users. Now, once the user logs in, the first time they log in, they will see all tabs as the default. Once they select that Amerispeak app as their base, home base, it'll, it's per, it will persist so that we don't have to change it every single time. So that was one of our findings is that, yeah, we, we have to have this all tabs app. The first time they log in, they have to go and select the proper select the proper app but then going forward they should be fine to not have to worry about it same thing on record type um, record type page layout assignments if you look down on the bottom left you see the account record types you can see again you can select a default and then on the permission set when you assign record types you just give access to the record type but you don't select the default so um, it depends on how your users use your Salesforce. So what does that mean? A lot of the things that we've done over the last few years is to get users away from using the new button, a new account, a new this, a new that. Instead, we will guide them through a series of flows based on business requirements if they want to do something. So if they wanted to add a new account, there's a new account button but this actually triggers a flow that walks them through the steps and we ask them specific questions. What kind of is this? What kind is that? Things like this. So depending on who they are and what their persona is, they see a certain set of questions specific to, let's say, account creation or opportunity creation. And they are either required to complete those fields or they can you know, ignore some of them. But what that allows us to do as administrators is at the end of the day, we know who is filling out this form and what kind of preset items should they should we attach to that record? So one of the preset things that we attach is a record type. So if it's an Amerispeak, we do an Amerispeak record type. If it's HCS, we do an HCS record type. So we define that in our flow. So a lot of the things that our users do, they're not actually using the new button per se. They're going through a wizard or a flow to get those things built. So Here's a deeper dive on the, Amer the Amerispeak user. Over on the left column, we've got our minimum access profile and then our permission set is the NORC base. Then if you look in the center column, we've added a permission set group called Amerispeak. If you look inside right below that, 
is the contents of the Amerispeak permission set group. We've got hierarchy view, which is a permission set from an installed package. We've got the NORC Amerispeak permission set that we created, which gives additional field access. And then we've got the project number requester which review, which is a, a bit of a specialty, but specific to NORC to Amerispeak. And then it got an arrow over there that's just saying, in our Amerispeak permission set, we've got a custom permission called Amerispeak as well. And then below that is just what we've got as our custom permission. It's just called Amerispeak. It's very simple. If you're not using custom permissions, you should definitely check them out. There's a link in the resources at the um, end of the presentation. So how do we use these custom permissions for our users? So over on the left side, there is, um, this is a little section, the far left is a little section from a lightning record page. And it, it's going to, we're going to show or hide this information based on the user's custom permission. So enterprise bid information shows two fields. Uh, in the field section, field selection, the middle column here, you can see that the filter is set to look at the user's custom permissions. And if they have eBid, if eBid equals true, if they have that permission, that custom permission, they can see those fields. So we don't have to you know, build a different page layout for different types of users. We can just turn on, show or hide the information based on that user's custom permission. And that custom permission eBid is a specialty permission that's assigned through a permission set. And now, uh, the other side of that is, if you look over on the right side columns, the top one is a flow that we use, and we're using custom permissions to determine what kind of a user is this, and then we're gonna branch off a path based on what kind of user they are. So if they're an Amerispeak user, they're gonna get all associated accounts. And if they're a non-Amerispeak user, we're gonna filter those that account request, that account get. And the way we filter, the way we to make that decision is in the decision tree there at the bottom. We just see that permission.amerispeak equals true. So it just checks the user that's running it, looks at their permissions, looks for a custom permission called Amerispeak. And if they do have it, they go left. If they don't have it, they go right, et cetera. So that's how we use those permissions. So that is the extent of what we really did, I, but I'm sure there are questions. So I will take as many questions as I can. Um, and we've got plenty of time for that. So let me just get out of here and close that. OK, so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, ask away or um, happy to share. Michael, Peter, um, on when you're talking about the, I can't remember what you, but the term that you used um, for the, the kind of the profile of the individuals. Um, the, what, the persona? What's that? Is it the persona? Yes, the persona. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about in like in a user story when you're kind of working through dev did you did you think of it in in a similar context or is that was that com, kind of completely different no it's very similar yeah our our team the way we sat down and we we did that we said okay we know we've got business units and then within those business units we have different types of users but then within each business unit we also have similar types of users as the other business unit do we need to build personas that are specific to the business unit and the user type, or do we just do it for the user type? And uh, where takeaway was that um, it was a little bit of both. So you know, we had we did the Ameris like as an example, the Amerispeak Pro Persona. A lot of our users do all the same things, so that's how we ended up with the base. Really, mm -hmm. is that. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff across here that is universal to all the users so we just use that in the base and that way we don't have to like you know have sub levels of our persona persona type a persona type b it's just kind of this persona 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 mm -hmm. and they do those things um and then if any of them needed to be layered on like there are financial analysts that are in the amerispeak region and there are financial analysts that are in the research region so we layer them on top that specialty functionality or that specialty access to those individuals rather than put it into the entire group. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jordan? Jordan? 
Jordan, we're not hearing you if you're asking. Hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry for that. Had my actual hardware muted there for a second, my headsets, though. So here we are. But um, my question is just kind of about your kind of your migration process. So um, did your team opt for, for kind of a big bang where you guys you know, migrated your entire user population over to sort of the new method uh, of enforcement? Or did you guys decide to kind of um, eat the elephant one bite at a time and start with just a fun, one, hey, you know, maybe this week we're going to move this functional group over to the new model. Next week we're going to move this other one to sort of minimize risk so you don't, you know, shut down the whole business, for example. Right, <laughs> on cut over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, good, great question. I, I meant to add a slide to that because we, we did, did it in a small bites. We did the whole thing in small bites at once we did the whole thing <laughs> at once in small bites i'll take, explain how what i mean by that so what we ended up doing is we had our profile that was the one piece that all of our users were not using that profile so that was a good thing we didn't have any users on that profile as it existed they were all on a custom profile that was created when the org was set up by an uh by another team um so that would have been the hardest part is to migrate the profile but all the other pieces, the permission sets, those were all brand new. So what we were able to do is we took our users and put them into their functional groups in, in, our, in our spreadsheets. And we went and loaded all of those permissions and permission set groups, attached all of those to those users, in addition to their already existing permission sets and profiles. Then we went through and we did business units and we switched the profile on the business unit if we needed to. Well, we did, but we switched the profile in the business unit. Didn't have any issues, right? Like, like we didn't have any issues with that because everybody still had their other permission sets that were granting access to other things. Then what we slowly did is we slowly took away those old permission sets that they didn't need anymore. We took those away a little bit at a time, kind of waited, you know, waited for a response, waited for feedback. Now that's to say, we had done a ton of testing in, U8, in our UAT sandbox before that as well. And, and we had our users going to do some testing with us. So we weren't overly concerned that we were missing something, but we did kind of push it all into our production and then slowly pull back what was already there so that what they, what they were left with was one profile, one base, and a, and a group. So that's how we did that. Okay, awesome, thank you. I got a quick question. Uh, did you ever run into like conflicting permissions where you had, you know, one permission set that granted access and another permission set that took away access? Um, so in this, in that sense, permission sets only open up access. Okay. So you can't, I can give you two permission sets. One of them is account read write delete and the other one is account read write you will have account read write delete if you have both permission sets so that's where the muting of the groups comes in partially so if you were to take those three those two and put them together in a person set group and then you mute out delete then you would have no delete you would only have read and write based on those two and delete would be muted or or removed in that in that case what if you had a a mute on one? Like if if they both had um, edit, you but then you had a mute on one of them. Does can you? You, you one still get edit. You still get edit because it just mutes that one thing. Yeah, so mutes just on that one per, uh, permission. Yeah. That, yeah, the permission set that, group is the umbrella. Yet. Yeah, it's an umbrella for okay. the things within underneath it. If you have an if you layer on that permissions another permission set that gives you read or mm -hmm. edit, you have mm -hmm. your group doesn't have edit, but you just tacked on edit above that. Mm -hmm. So you overrode that. Oh, okay. I can imagine a disorganized person could make <laughs> interesting. Got mess. a lot of spreadsheets lying yeah, around totally. for us for sure.
So that flow at the end was pretty interesting. Have you done or considered uh, automations that would help configure users? And I asked because I have some other people that are creating stuff and they'll create salespeople and forget to enable forecasting or they'll forget to put the manager in, which jacks up our approval rules and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it would be kind of cool if the flow can say, if I pick this role, you know, fill in this stuff. Yeah, there's some tools that are coming online. Um, I didn't mention them because they're still beta or open beta. But if you, um, you'll get the presentation. There's some links to a lot of the posts that Cheryl puts out um, on the admin group. Talk about uh, some of the releases. But one of the things that comes is coming out is you can set up criteria if a user is created and they match specific criteria. Then it actually runs through a, a setup process where it gets um, permissions, profiles, things like that assigned to them wow. based on criteria. Um, it's in beta, and uh, I haven't used it yet, but that is one of the, the things that she's working on or that her team is working on to make life easier for, for all of us. That's pretty cool. So, Michael, we have that. Um, mm -hmm. Anytime you change a role, it runs through um, and goes through kind of a complex engine we built, but beside that point, and then completely modifies anything um, that you might be able to or not see through permission set, permission set group, public groups, and all that. The the one caveat to why this sounds so much easier than it is, is it's a mixed DML statement. So anything that happens on the user record, you can only do in a separate transaction. So you need to like set like a you know do in the future type thing inside of a flow and then you know set that to like negative one minutes and it'll fire that whenever Salesforce decides it should fire. Or you need to build advanced patterns like um, event, you know, publish to an event bus and then have that process it. But you need to get it out of that same transaction. And that's where I think the stuff that Michael talked about that they're building in the future removes a lot of that uh, yeah. frustration is the nicest way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you've ever tried to do a user edit from a flow, you can only make, what is it, one DML on that user one you can only change one thing at a time if you were to run a flow so uh, it's only and it's specific to users right so it's um painful in that way so we've we were i think we way back when tried to do some um setups with flows and it kept failing or we actually we have a deactivation flow if a user doesn't log in for 90 days it deactivates them and sends a note to their uh, supervisor and um we did something where it was deactivating it and doing something else to the end, it was, just doesn't work because you can only do one thing at a time. You have to do some sort of time delay or something along those lines. Any other questions that we can, for the group or in general, or things I can I, add to the presentation? I, so, I do. Um, I'm thinking about a situation where I have an inherited organization it has lots and lots of custom profiles and some permission sets, and I'm not sure exactly who has what specific permissions for what purpose. And I'm wondering if you used a tool to say, um, let me compare this profile to sort of the minimum access and see what it adds without having to look at every single per, uh, system permission and every custom object and every field and every custom object. <laughs> A really tedious there are process. a lot of tools out there that will help you with that. Um, and there is another beta tool from the Salesforce team that is coming, that is in beta as well, that'll look at those kinds of comparisons. But the one that we use um, is called uh, Config Workbook, duh, geez. Um, so that one, you can install that into a sandbox and run it in that sandbox. You can pull a couple reports for free, I think you get five reports for free, and then you can pay for it again. The nice thing is you can install into another sandbox and run another five reports. So if you needed to do kind of those things, you might have to spin up a couple sandboxes to do it and get it get them out there for free. But it's really actually really pretty affordable, um, and it has a lot more tools available. But it does do a permission set to profile compare, permissions to profile comparisons, and profile to profile and those kinds of things, and it just gives you a nice Excel document of what is what and is this one has this but this one does not and this one has this and this one does not and back and forth so 
config workbook. Highly recommend it. Cool. Thank, thank you. So going back to that flow, um, you said you're going to do one thing per flow trigger. If you had a flow that had a five minute delay and a 10 minute delay, could those two delays do separate things or it's just one data point change per flow trigger? Dan? Uh, I would love to speak to that in any sort of meaningful way, but I got frustrated with it and it's just an apex which handles it significantly oh. better. <laughs> we use a few different patterns because we haven't we haven't cleaned up some tech debt to consolidate, but um, for the most part in the flow, we we handle a lot of the logic there. That flow then proceedingly just calls out to an invocable class. And then the invocable class, whichever one it calls to, will either call back into our org via the API, which is now considered a net new transaction to, to do the thing, or it will publish to a platform event where we then have a platform event uh, listener. Like you can use Flow or Apex, whatever you like. And that then handles it, which is considered a net new transaction. Um, so yeah, I, Again, it's very, it's the user object is the most frustrating object in Salesforce, mm. short of CPQ and a handful of other like weird objects, but it is definitely one of the most frustrating due to the, the mixed DML. You can, if you touch the user object until that transaction is done, completed, you cannot touch any other thing from any record, any metadata, you are locked to just touching that user object. And permissions is the a, a separate kind of object of, of really, it's a se separate junction table. So you can't add things in there unless you do it in a net new transaction. Yeah. Like for our deactivation that we talked about a second ago, um, we do all of the, all of the um, minor adjustments and our chatter posts to the manager as an example in the immediate transaction. And then we have an AC leg that runs if it needs to deactivate the user and runs out. And so because they're not logging in, it doesn't really, you know, can run whenever Salesforce wants it to and just deactivate them from there. So it, we've only done that one kind of hitch leg out there. We're not trying to do multiple delays and things like that. But in that case, we had to put it in immediate action and an async action and let that happen. Chris is at, um, Chris is asking, do multiple subflows count as a net new transaction? I think a subflow triggers from a flow and it's all part of one transaction. Yeah, a, a subflow is not a net new transaction unless your subflow, and again, I don't know flow super well since they've made significant adjustments to it since the last time I was actually building stuff. Um, again, if you call a subflow, for, basically anytime you do that like asynchronous or like do in the future thing, I forget exactly what it's called, Things called like scheduled actions. A scheduled action will be a net new transaction. Yeah, and the subflows count as one thing. Just come in, come in as one. It's like, I'm a flow. You told me to go get a subflow. I go get that. It's all part of this. You know, like I'm gonna have dinner. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna make my chicken. I'm gonna make my my side. I'm gonna make my thing. It's all part of dinner. The the flow dinner. But I go do that. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap up the recording here. And um, so let me, let me just, I'm going to edit it. Hold on, ready? Okay. So th thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you got something good out of it and uh, I'll get this shared with everybody. And uh, we all will meet uh, next time as well. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.